Shalom, shalom. All praises, glory, and honor be unto you. How about you? shy. Double honors unto the apostles and the elders of GMS. Salutations to the fellow laborers that are doing this work in truth and sincerity, confusion of faith, brothers that are joined unto our ranks. All right, to the hopeful elect and the Akwakim that's listening and learning. Call Halal Yahweh by Hashem, Yahweh Shai, by Hashem, Rakar Kadash. Um, this is uh, the skyline of the city of Chicago. Um, one of the most recognizable skylines, you know, in the world today, you know, second probably only to uh, New York and, uh, and Tokyo. But uh, very, very recognizable skyline when you're looking at it from either angle and that's from the uh that angle there is 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 from the north like the north uh northeastern view of it okay but nevertheless still recognizable all right probably the most recognizable is the western you know when you're on the lakefront looking back at it but nevertheless very recognizable um and this video is called the racist history of chicago's housing policies all right, Inside Chicago, part one. And uh, I'm just going to let some of this video play. This is all through the spirit. You know, I do have a couple scriptures in mind to bring out. Um, but I'm going to play some of this video and a couple others just to prove a point. So, you know, call hello, you how about you, how about shy. Let's, let's let it, let the spirit take course. It's spectacular downtown next to Lake Michigan with its famous theaters and incredible architecture. Top that off with some of the most passionate sports fans in the country. You get the picture. But the other face of Chicago is known for its violence and the thousands of lives lost in recent years. One child is killed in Chicago every week. And this is the face of Chicago that seems to dominate the headlines and the national conversation surrounding the city. You walk down the street, you get shot. In and, you know, one thing about that is that Chicago is nowhere as near as bad as they make it out to be. Truth be said, it's number eight on the most violent cities in America. St. Louis is actually the murder capital of of uh, of, of America right now. But um, St. Louis isn't an important enough city. Whatever that 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 they plan on doing to bring on this whole FEMA and, and you know, you know, when the when when the whole craziness happens, when society shuts down and they start moving on the people, I do believe that Chicago is going to be the epicenter of it may even be the beginning of it. Uh, I assume that it would be California, but it's between those two. It's between California and Chicago, I do believe, through the spirit, man. But I'm thinking more in Chicago because they're in the la in the recent years, there's been so many movies depicting the destruction of Chicago, all right, uh, FEMA camps, martial law, apocalyptic scenes in Chicago in like the last six, seven years, all right, it's just, it just happens over and over again, and as I said, truth be said, Chicago is eighth on the list in America, but you would never know that watching, you know, the fake news media of America, they focus on Chicago for some reason, all right, Chicago, they've had thousands of shootings, thousands. And I'm saying, where is this? Is this a war-torn country? But this narrative of carnage, of endemic violence, is incomplete. I know this because I'm from Chicago. It's a beautifully diverse place with a population almost evenly split between Black, White, and Latino Americans. But Chi-Town is also one of the most racially divided cities in the United States. Most of these ethnic groups live in different neighborhoods separated by geography. Segregation is like air and water. We just live it, we just breathe it, we don't really think about it. It's just sort of how things are. I wanted to find out how Chicago got this way and how its segregation led to so many of its problems. Chicago's segregation is best explained on a map. You have your north side, you have your south side, and you have your west side. To the east is the lake. Those terms, north, south, and west, have subtle meanings that relate to the racial segregation of Chicago. And so when you say the north side, people are sometimes subtly meaning the white side. And the south side, especially today, is predominantly black. And so when you say the south side, you are... And that's when it comes to knowing the real history about Chicago, because the south side used to be white. OK. Especially over here where I am. All right. 
There was a lot of white people lived on the south side. You had Germantown, you had all the Jewish people, you had a whole lot of uh, uh, white people that lived here, okay? The north side was mostly Northern Kingdom. A lot of gentr gentrification has happened on the north side in the last 30 years or so, all right? Because where, where uh, uh, the Cubs Park is, that was a lot of uh, Ephraimites that lived up there that owned businesses up and, up and down those, those uh, streets and in those neighborhoods and in Humble Park. Uh, a little bit west and south of the uh, of the Cubs Park of Wrigley Field, all right. And now all those areas have been heavily gentrified, and that's little. That's what Esau does. Every 30, 20 to thirty years, you know, or I would say thirty to forty years, what they do is they they move Jake around because they don't want Jake to to set roots, uh, start buying and purchasing properties and passing them to their children. So they they constantly make Jake move and keep them in a rental status. This is a, uh, one of the policies of Esau that he's been doing, you know, for 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 uh, damn near 100 years now. Subtly meaning the black side. Chicago is very territorial. Like for me growing up, it was OK. I know not to go to Bridgeport. Like this is a place that's not really welcoming to African-Americans. This geographic segregation is it's true in the 70s and the 80s, man. You you, you had a lot of uh, uh, a lot of Jake's would get get beat up or even killed in Bridgeport, man. And Bridgeport is full of uh, 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 retired cops and, and firemen, just like over here where I live on the southeast side, which they don't really mention. You you will even hear her say uh, there is no east side. Well, there is. It's a southeast side. So you got the south side and then you got the east side. And the east side is a little pocket that's up on the, uh, the southeast corner of the city right before you hit Indiana. It's no accident. It was engineered over years of deliberate policies. In the early 1900s, Chicago was largely a city of white immigrants. The Great Migration of the 20th century brought millions of black Americans out of the violent Jim Crow South hoping for a better life. By the end of the 1940s, nearly half a million black Americans lived in Chicago, mostly in a small corridor on the South Side called the Black Belt. As the now that's some heavy history about the Black Belt there. Um, I've gone into that. The black belt actually became when when Jake separates from Esau, they actually do better than Esau because the black belt. All oh, you saw how small the black belt was, but uh, history will show you. Actually, you can you know there's a book behind me uh, called A Hidden History, and it actually goes into that history on the black belt. And the Edomites and all the other heathens were actually coming to the black belt to shop to go to the nightclubs, to go to the jazz clubs, all right? In the black belt, they have their own banks. You can see these drinks are very well-dressed and well-to-do. They have their own banks, their own movie theaters, their own grocery stores. They didn't venture out into the white neighborhoods. And what did they end up doing? They ended up burning the black belt down. And that black belt area is called Bronzeville today. And there's no, and you got gigantic brownstones like the one that the brother St. Benji uh, lives in. You got these gigantic brownstones and graystones which are really mansions okay and and what's left of them from from that destruction and then um another thing they did is they built the dan ryan expressway right through the black belt and separated it all right to make sure that it would never rise up again okay so when jake separated from 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 uh um, esau they actually did better the same story happened down in rosewood if you watch that movie rosewood OK, and then you, of course, then you had the uh, the famous, uh, uh, um, you know, thing that happened in, in Oklahoma, Black Wall Street. But uh, uh, Chicago also had a very famous area like Black Wall Street, but well to do jakes with their own banks and everything, man. And Esau burned it to the ground. OK, out of jealousy and anger. And because why? They didn't want to see Jake do well. The policy is the policy in America is that America was put together and the laws were put together for the so-called uh, white man. Let's read. Uh, let me grab a scripture. This is um, Psalm seventy-three and uh, yeah, the seventy-third chapter. Uh, and I'm going to start at verse three, and it says, "For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, which we shouldn't be." All right. Um. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. 
They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. So Esau, you know, up until now, because the curses are falling upon him, that's not the case anymore. But you're looking at this time. Uh, I imagine that most of the men that you see in this picture, they're all dead and gone. And a lot of them probably died in those riots. And, and, and you know, uh, when uh, when when they had the riots of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of of in the black belt, man, a lot of those guys uh, more than likely they 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 died, you know. But uh, real quick, just for a little comfort, this is uh. Deuteronomy 30 and 7. And Yahweh thy power will put all these curses upon thy enemies and on them that hate thee and, and which persecute thee. And, and, and that's what you're witnessing now. The decline and destruction of America for what they did to Jacob, man. For the destruction of the, of, of the black belt, for black Wall Street, for slavery, for the Jim Crow laws, for redlining. Okay? She might even mention redlining in this. Because what that did, what redlining did was it prevented uh, Jacob from buying and owning property and kept them in, in, in impoverished states where well, Esau was able to uh, uh, continually buy property and pass it on to to their to their family members, to their children, to their grandchildren. So this this kept them in a perpetual state where they were so much further ahead of you uh, financially. And then they will poke and make fun of you. Um, they set up policy to keep you down and then make fun of you when you're down as if you're if you as if you can't do what they do. When they sell a policy to do that. But the Black Belt, Black Wall Street, and Rosewood is proof here in America that Jake could actually do better than Esau, and they did. Even in the country that was made for them. And that's why those places were destroyed and don't stand anymore today. Black population increased. They faced housing practices that were completely racist yep. and yet completely legal. One of the worst was a practice called redlining, there which allowed is. banks to refuse home loans to black residents wanting to move into mostly white neighborhoods. This happened to cities nationwide, from Chicago to Oakland to Baltimore. Realtors and homeowners signed restrictive covenants saying they wouldn't sell to black families in those white neighborhoods. And after World War II, the federal government subsidized white veterans with low interest loans for fresh new homes in suburbia. And that's the neighborhood that I live in. All these houses over here were set up for white, for Edomite soldiers, man. That's why they're all in rows and look similar. Like, like they all, some of the houses look so much alike, it almost looked like a, a military base when you're driving through it because everything is so uniform. And there's also why almost every house has a a, a, a post with it for a flag. And a lot of these these the, and a lot of these coons around here, these Mexicans, because that's still with the with the the, uh, the majority of people in this neighborhood. Fly flags um, from their houses, man. And you still got some Polish and some Serbs over here, the ones who couldn't afford to leave when all the white flight happened. All right. And now you got a lot of Judah that's moved into here, too. So this country, I mean, this part of uh, the southeast side is becoming a, a melting pot, man, because you got a uh, you got um, a lot of Ephraimites and some Cuban and you got Am uh, Moab moving over here, man. So this is becoming a very mixed multitude over here. You know, which and all it is is that, you know, Yahweh is just preparing for when these race riots starts, man. You know, so all these uh, Edomites the, and, and the close prox proximity, it's going to be bad for them when, when those days come. All these people that uh, these gentrifying Edomites that move into these neighborhoods, when when these riots break out, when this when this fall of uh, when the, when the uh, rule of law is, is put out the way, it's going to get real bad for them. With big yards and highways to get there. The federal government was basically saying neighborhoods that are racially integrated are a high are high risk neighborhoods, and so we're not going to insure those mortgages in those neighborhoods. Um, so they were um, supporting a suburbanization that led to predominantly white suburbs and predominantly black urban neighborhoods. Quick scripture: They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heaven, and their tongue walketh through the earth. So they're they set their mouths against the Lord and their tongue, their way, their their thought process, their vibration walks through the earth. And their, and their, and their vibration is oppress everyone else, keep everyone else poor while we get rich. I mean, the scripture did say that the fatness, their blessing was they would have the fatness of the earth, the best parts of the cities, the best part of, of wherever they are. And they will push everyone off into a corner, which is what ghetto means, you know, uh, uh, you know, to be basically put off into a corner. All right, let's switch this up. 
We came to Levittown and we found the model house and we walked in and we looked around and uh, of course in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto so to speak it was an interesting experience interesting lifestyle seeing all the new modern conveniences very fascinating Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality. And the things that a lot of soldiers did, that, that Negro, Latino, and Native soldiers did, uh, helped keep American power. You know, you had the wind talkers in World War II. Uh, uh, you had the Jake that fought down there in the, uh, the, in the, in the Spanish-American Wars, all right? And you had Jake that fought valiantly in World War I and World War II and Vietnam. And a lot, many battles were won because of Jacob, man. And then they would come home. Some of them were even hung in uniform, man. The houses burned. The crosses burned on their house and they were hung in front of their own houses, man. Because you go fight for the country and then Esau turn around and, and, and hang you because you killed white men. All right, they showed you that in, uh, in Rosewood, the movie Rosewood. If you haven't seen it, I highly suggest you watch it. And the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. Those are those GI loans. I actually have one that I've yet to even use yet. All right. But Esau had me so messed up credit wise over the, over the years because of different events. I doubt if I'd ever get to use it. All right. I've yet to even use the damn thing. All right. Because every veteran is 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 uh, is, is granted one. OK. But none of this is going to matter in a minute because, you know, America is the Titanic, man. It's sinking quickly. You know, the, 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 the destruction has already happened and the ship is going down. I went up to the salesman. We're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. So he passed it off. As though it wasn't real, that you can't imagine. Hey, it was real easy to pass it off to you. It wasn't, it's not me. I'd sell to you. Okay? But you know what? Quick scripture. It says, Woe to the rebellious children, say of Yahweh, that take counsel, but not of me. And that cover, and that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may ask sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. And the trust in the shadow of Egypt. They trust in, in the place that actually oppresses them. And they keep running back and running back to their oppressor for help. And their oppressor's not gonna give you help. Your oppressor's gonna set you up to fail. Period. Alright? He's gonna make as much as he can make off you, and then he's gonna set you up to fail. It's as simple as that. What's up, YouTube? So today we're talking about Chirac. Today we're talking about a recent video that was uploaded by an ex-gang member that was in Chicago. And sure enough, there was a crate of guns. And during that time when we in it, you're not thinking about where did the guns just come from. I'm going to cut it off right there. See, I didn't think about... And see, he wasn't lying, man. This guy, when he was talking about the crate of guns and where did they come from, when he was in it, he was young. But... That that video is a couple years old, but you know, the same thing was happening in the 90s and the same thing was happening. I think that's what he was talking about in the 90s when it happened. And the same thing was happening in the 80s and the 70s, man. All right. I, I can't I can't say that I ever seen any personally with my myself. You know, I didn't you know, I grew up in Chicago, but I went down with that gang shit. I was actually very much against it. You know, I guess I was always about my people, you know, um, just not according to knowledge, but, uh, but you know, I grew up with a lot of gangbangers, you know, I, I went to school with them. I knew them. I was, I was friends with a lot of them with opposing sides, 
You know, it's funny. I lived on a block that uh that basically had was like a dividing line, and and the, the guys on my block all grew up together, were all friends, but were in, but but were in different gangs, and 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 only respected and and you know, and there was never really a whole lot that went down among them outside of little scraps here and there, is because they all grew up together, so they they kept that bond, but you know, but they still were in different gangs though. Where other parts of the city, you know, these guys would, would kill each other. So it was just kind of weird, the block that I grew up on, you know, how, how that kind of went down that way. Because, you know, somebody had a problem, you know, you actually, you, 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 you fought it out with that person. And, you know, the gangs didn't come into it. All right. But that wasn't the case. But either way it goes, man, all these guys that I grew up with would always, uh, um, you know, come up, come, have these guns and this stuff like this. And they would always say how they got them from the crates. They got them from the, from the crates, from the trains, and they got them off the trucks. Okay. So they would park these trucks in neighborhoods, you know, where, where Jacob dwells and they would leave them unlocked or ins, uh, uh, unsecure. And they, and then, you know, and these, these little punks would get their hands on, on, on these, on this stuff, man. All right. Sometimes they would get equipment and sell it, man. I remember one summer, everybody was driving around and, uh, what, what, the, the little what they call them the go karts and the uh, the mini bikes, all right? Because right, they was passing them around and and selling them to uh, to other people for cheap because they had gotten them from the crates, you know, off the off those damn uh, trucks and those and those trains that were sitting. I lived right by a train yard, so that was an easy thing to do for Esau to set you up. Oh, guns that way? I never really thought about it. You know, everything with gun violence and gun control, I haven't really thought about really. But as far as drugs are concerned, I've actually thought about that. I, let me tell you something. After being in college for a year, regardless of whatever it happens, you're going to learn something. You're going to. I went through a phase, which I still do now from time to time, but I went through a phase where I was just watching straight documentaries. Literally, every chance I get, I was watching documentaries. I've watched a lot of documentaries on a lot of controversial things as well. One of them being Gangs in America. I forget what's the title of it, but I know it was talking about the creation of Bloods and Crips. And, one of and when you look, the Bloods and Crips, the Gangster Disciples, the, uh, the, the Vice Lords, the Blackstones, all those gangs in the beginning were not gangs as far as, you know, gang banging gangs. Those those groups, those organizations, as I will call them, they weren't created to be gangs. They were created to protect uh, the neighborhoods from from rogue white men. All right. Quite frankly, because because you had that time period when Jake was getting beaten up and hung so much. Jake started standing up and fighting for themselves, and these gangs formed to keep these truckloads of uh, 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 of white guys from rolling through on pickups, jumping out, you know, with baseball bats and beating Jake senseless, senseless, and snatching up one of our uh, couple, one or, or a couple of our women, and they would drive them off to a, a forest preserve somewhere and run trains on them, gang rape them. All right, or they would snatch up Jake, drive him off some somewhere, and uh, you know, pull him into the truck, beat beat him senseless, and then hang him somewhere. You know, and the gangs actually formed to protect the neighborhoods in the beginning. And then Esau introduced the drugs and the, and the, and the guns and made it work in his favor. All right. Then he could send Jake to, you know, get Jake caught up in his in his uh, prison system, which is privately owned, which made the the the, uh, the people who had stock in the prisons become wealthy. So they set up laws and policies to. to uh, and, you know, and Jake is false for the okie doke, you know, so you read a lot of neighborhood. Make it void of opportunity and job, jobs and, you know, and careers and that whole sort of thing. And then you drop off guns and drugs, you know, and that what that the Esau wins both ways. All right. Because you, you either end up dead or you end up in this prison system, in this court system, making the money that way. One of the things that they were speaking on in that documentary was how heroin around the 80s or so became really popular. Especially crack. Oh, boy. But here's the thing. That stuff is expensive and where it was getting really popular these were poverty stricken areas. And the question that lit off a light bulb in my head was how are people in these poverty stricken areas? Actually, he said something slightly wrong. Coke is expensive. What they did was they took Coke and they broke it down. And that's where they came up with crack was even more addictive and more damaging. And it was cheap. And they targeted that at the hood. That hit Judah real hard. Hit the northern king of some too. But mostly was aimed at Judah. It's just like I've heard brothers say. That this opioid thing is is actually that balance, that justice. The curse is now falling on 
uh, uh, Esau because that meth is, is, is like crack. It's worse than crack and it's destroying Edomites. All right. They say a uh, hundred a day from meth die. And I don't even know how many die from the opioids daily. So they're so they have a really bad problem among the white population here in America with meth and opioids, man. So it, it's all coming back on them. Areas able to buy highly expensive drugs. You see the contradiction? You can barely pay rent that's about maybe 500 bucks and then you have to pay all your other utility bills and everything, yet you're able to buy crack and heroin? Something's not adding up. Who are people who are able to buy such things? People with money. Who are some of the most wealthiest people in America? And we all know the drug game is a business. A lot of these drugs were sent overseas. So how are drugs from overseas getting to areas like this? We exactly. need money to do those things. And if you are doing that, how are you not getting caught? You see where I'm going with this? And what this man talks about in his video is that the government would send boxes of guns and ammo and yep. just put it in alleyways. Dump it off around 6.30 in the morning so everybody's either at work or they're at sleep. But all the people who ain't got nothing to do. He says it in his video. People come in. He said it happened twice in his life. Why would he lie about something like that? Really? Why would you lie about something like that? Everybody goes out and gets some. Hey, the police are locking people up constantly in Chicago every single day. They're taking guns off the street every single day. Every day. So how is it that all of these guns just keep appearing? Bruh. And what he said makes perfect sense because it's a lose-lose situation. And even though that somebody is doing this, you still can't put the people who are using the gun. You can't say they're not at fault either because you haven't. Well, because they're stupid and they won't listen to their leaders, man. All right. That's why. It's, so it's it's just a, you know, you just caught up in a snare because Esau didn't set up real leaders, man. He set up these churches. All right. And these churches don't teach nationality. They don't, they don't teach. They don't teach. Uh, they don't teach about Yahweh Shai, about Yahweh and Yahweh Shai. They don't even have the real name in these churches, man. They're still calling on Jehovah, Jesus, Yahweh, Yahshua, you know, all these uh, improper names, man. And the name is very important. That's the most important thing. All right. This is uh, Isaiah uh, 42 and 22. It says, but this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth for the spoil and none restoreth. So Esau just making money off you. So he, he, you either end up dying, corrupting and destroying your people, or you end up in his prison system making him money. All right. It says, this is verse 24. Who gave Jacob for a spoil in Israel for robbers? Did not Yahweh? He who against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto the, to his law. So until our people wake up, and that's what's happening, and that's why Esau is so unoffensive and so horrified because of videos like this, brothers like myself who keep constantly pushing this truth. But hey, but the family of the word is coming. We're not going to be able to do this for, for, you know, for much longer, man. So, you know, the end is near, man, and it's manifest. All right. So with that, I hope this was a, a edifying lesson. All right. And, and a horrifying condemnation to Esau, Edom and the heathen. Call Halal Yahweh Bashim Abashai, Wa'ababa Ball.